<laughs> Great. Uh, Mary wants to respond to the question that Andy asked before. Can you do that now? Yeah, so um, Andy's question, as far as I can remember, was, um, so can leaders, although the leader's primary role is to equip people, but can leaders do ministry work as well? Um, you know, Malcolm gave his answer. But also, I think of Jesus. Uh, if we think of Jesus, what did Jesus do? Jesus did a lot of ministry work, right? But Jesus didn't primarily do ministry work. Actually, primarily Jesus, thank you. Jesus built leaders, built disciples. Um, and he, um, whenever he was doing ministry work, he was always very intentional in using those ministry opportunities uh, as a training site for the leaders he was building. And so can, can we imagine if Jesus only did ministry work, didn't build those leaders, what would happen? <coughs> so although, yeah, although it was very important that Jesus did those ministry works, but it's even more important that Jesus built leaders. And when Jesus did the ministry works, he did through those ministry works, he managed, he, he, he demonstrated the Father, you know, he manifested the Father, he, 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 he taught people, equipped people, but primarily he used those opportunities to build leaders. So a very clear example is feeding of the 5,000. You know, the Bible clearly says Jesus knew what to do. But he said, Philip, you feed them. Why does he do that? Actually, in the end, it took him to feed the 5,000. But still, he gave the opportunity to Philip. And so, um, because he knew in the days ahead, you know, Philip and other leaders, disciples, will be encountering those similar situations all the, all the days of their life. You know, the challenge, the need, it's always beyond what the, the, the resources they have, their capacity. So they need to be trained to learn, to depend on God, and let God, you know, function, let God minister in the gap between what they have and the demands of the needs. So, um, so they need to be, they need to be trained to, to be comfortable in walking into these situations and depending on God and let God do the miracle. Okay. So, uh, and Jesus was very, very intentional. Many situations like that. You know, he was watching those guys, those disciples struggling in the boat in the storm, but he was watching. He didn't just go immediately to rescue them because he's always very intentional in stretching them, in building them. So whatever situation he found the, uh, the, the, the disciples, and whatever he was doing, he always, that's why he took the talk to be with him. You know, whatever he was going through, whatever he was doing, these guys were always with him, watching him. And, 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 and he let, him, let them participate in what he was doing. Sometimes he sent them out to do it themselves. So um, I think that's a very, very, very good model. Not very good, it's a very beautiful model for us to follow as leaders. <coughs> Understanding our primary calling, our primary role as a leader is to build people, is to equip people, not primarily just do the ministry work. Because we can't imagine what if Jesus didn't build a leader, but primarily did the ministry work. There would be no future. Yeah. So um, that's yeah. just a little bit of what I want to say. Yeah. In to. Good. Thank you. Good. Is that good? Let's go to page 48, please. And here are, this is a, like a summary of the major paradigm shifts that we have looked at so far. So four big paradigm shifts shifting from the traditional paradigm to the New Testament paradigm. Paradigm shift number one. The question is, who builds the church? Without looking at the slide, which I know is probably hard to do. <laughs> In the traditional paradigm, who builds the church? The leaders do the ministry work and the church is built up. In the New Testament paradigm, who builds the church? The people do the work. The people build the church. This is a profound shift of thinking. I mean, leaders even call themselves ministers, you know, because we do the ministry work. Therefore, we are ministers. In reality, who are the ministers? 
Yeah, the leaders should be called the builders, the equippers, yeah? The people do the work. That's what builds up the church. All right, so this is the first paradigm shift. Who builds the church? Who builds the church? The people. Good. That's good. The second shift, what is the role of the people of God? What are the people of God supposed to do? In the traditional paradigm? Needy objects, passive recipients of the leader's ministry. Look in uh, Ephesians 2, please. Verse 10. Look at this. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Who's he talking about? We. Who's we? Every member. Every member functioning. Look at the incredible uh, opportunity, the gift that God has given every member to do the work. So as a leader... If your attitude to the people is, well, I'm the one who is, you know, I've been trained to do the ministry. I can do the ministry. Um, and therefore, you are the object of me doing the ministry. You don't believe the word of God. You are contradicting the calling that God has given to every member. Now think about this in the context of your own children. How many of you have children? What's your hope for your children? That they will remain passive, needy objects of your help for their entire life? Is that for your hope for your children? Oh, goodness me. What do you want for your children? You want them to grow up and do what? Small things? Big things. Man, you've got all kinds of vision and hope and a sense of destiny. Don't you? For your children? You want to see them conquer nations. Yes? Well, what do you think God has in His attitude toward His children? So don't stand in God's way. He wants to see His children excel in the precious calling that He gave them before the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. That's who they are. They're not just weak and dumb and passive and needy. They're sons and daughters of the living God. And God has given you the responsibility not just to wipe their nose every time it they, they have a cold, but he's given you the responsibility to equip them to be the powerful men and women of God that God has ordained and to do the works that God has given to them to do before the foundation of the world. That's your role as the leader. Amen. Amen. This is a huge change of thinking. And, and think about the difference that this makes when you interact with the people. If I'm interacting with a member of my church and they're just, you know, passive, needy, I'm not going to last long. Not very long. I'm going to be irritated, grumpy, <laughs> frustrated. But if, I'm, but if I'm relating to them as a child of the living God, son and a daughter of the living God, who I am called to equip, to envision, to raise up, to empower, to release. Wow. Now I'm excited about talking to them. Come on. Who are you? Where are you going? What are you going to do? Let's open some doors for you. How can I serve you to be all that God has called you to be? Rather than I'm going to peek every night, I'm going to get a call from you because something's not you know, you need more help in something or other, some little thing. Yeah? Totally different relationship to the people of God, isn't it? When I see them as those who will be doing the work of the ministry. 
Great. So that's the second. The f what was the first paradigm shift? Who builds the church? Who builds the church? Who should build the church? The people. Second paradigm shift. And what is their role? Do the work of the ministry. Amen. Yeah. Build up the body of Christ. God yeah, God prepared before the foundation of the world. Third paradigm shift. So then, let's define the role of the leader. In the traditional paradigm, what does a leader do? Like everything, basically. You know what's funny? Uh, years ago, in, in my church, in America, in America... You know, Americans like to have every month is sort of the month of something or other, you know. It's just an American thing. And, and, and I think it's October is Pastoral Appreciation Month, okay? So, so anyway, one brother came to me uh, one day on Sunday. And he said, Malcolm, you know, uh, in October. And he said, I was listening to Christian radio. <coughs> and on Christian radio uh, that week... Uh, they came on and they were promoting Pastoral Appreciation Month. <coughs> this literally happened just the way I'm telling it to you. <laughs> this is such a cool story. And so, um, uh, so he said, I was listening to this radio and, and, and they were promoting, you know, you need to appreciate your pastor. He does so much for you. He comes and visits you when you're sick. He holds your hand when you're feeling bad. He wipes your nose when it's running. He didn't say that, but, you know, that sort of thing. He, he, gives, he brings you breakfast in bed. He shines your shoes. You know, it's just on all this list of things that your, that your pastor does for you, you know. And, 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 and he does everything in the church. He mows the lawn for the church, and his wife arranges the flowers, and he does all the teaching and all the visitation and all the prayer and... And, and on and on and on. And, uh, and he said, you know, Malcolm, I was listening to this long list of things that you should be appreciative of your pastor because look at all this stuff that he does for you. And he said, Malcolm, there was not a single thing on that list that you do. <laughs> not one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I thought, and I thought, whoa, yes, Lord, I've succeeded. Thank God. That's certainly my goal. And the wild thing was, at the time, our church was thriving. It was booming. It's not like it was falling apart because I wasn't doing all of this work. It's because, meanwhile, we had a full-time leader development program, yeah, that I was leading. I was building leaders, high capacity young people. I was personally investing in their lives. I was doing this. I was overseeing the spiritual infrastructure, you know, making sure that things were uh, taking overall responsibility. But I was not meeting needs. I was setting the vision, the vision for the people doing the work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's what he said. Not a single thing. Now. Uh, Anyana may ask before about what are the indicators of healthy church? That's a good one. <laughs> when the people tell you there's not a single thing that you're doing on the, the endless list of things that you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Great. So what actually is the role of the leader? Equip the people build leaders, shape culture, create an environment for the people to do the work. Yeah. And that's hard work. See, the, the leader works hard. The leader works really, really hard in a healthy church. It's not that he's just sort of, well, I'm not going to do anything. Thank God for this new model because I can just be lazy, you know. No, you, you actually are working really, you're working at least as hard as, you know, the old. You're just doing very different things. Actually, you're probably not working as hard because that guy works 24 by 7, meeting the needs, yeah? So you're not actually doing that. Um, but, but you're still working hard. It's an appropriate hard work. Yeah. I was leading the church, running the, directly leading the full-time training program, writing books, 
and traveling overseas helping leaders to build leaders at the same time. Can you imagine doing that if I'm the one that has to personally meet every need? And the church was thriving. Fourth paradigm shift. How is the healthy church built? In the traditional model? We're running the programs. In the healthy church, what's our focus? Yeah. That's what Jesus told us to do. Go and make disciples. Build people. That's what Paul told the leaders to do. Equip the people. These are the four uh, major paradigm shifts. So here's your next assignment. In your teams, please think about what would happen when we don't follow the principles of the healthy church. When we have the leader doing everything, the, le the leader meeting every need, the people are just passive objects. What happens to the leader? What happens to the people? What happens to the church? This is your assignment. We'll give you three minutes. When the leader doesn't do the right thing, when he's not equipping the people, but he's trying to run the programs, trying to meet all the needs, what happens to the leader? What happens to the people? What happens to the church? What happens to the leader? <laughs> Burned out. Burned out. How many people had that as their first answer? That was the first thing you thought of. High blood pressure. High blood pressure, yeah. Yeah, sickness, 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 physical sickness. Anxiety. Anxiety. Emotional, yeah, depression, emotional, emotional, um, unhealth. Feeling it as a failure. Look, if you're trying to meet needs, you know what? You literally can never succeed. Because you can meet a thousand needs and there are 10,000 more before you even finish. It's endless. You can't do that. There'll be no one to officiate them. Wow. That is an insight. That, that is an insight that, that only Bill would have. <laughs> Beautifully spoken. Tootie. Sacrifice family. You know, one of the... You know, things that we see everywhere in the world, you know, think about the local leaders' children. And it, this is true everywhere in the world that so often the local church leaders' kids are not even walking with God. Sometimes they're like the worst kids in the church. That even happens all the time. Family failure might be what we what are we yeah. write Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sacrifice family. Marriage. Yeah, yeah. Broken marriage. Yeah. Yeah. The pastor becomes a hero. He becomes a celebrity. Yeah, because everybody's looking at him, loving him, grateful to him for everything he's doing. He falls into temptation. Sometimes, sometimes even deliberately, uh, because he's so burned out and he doesn't know how to get out of it. He's like, the hamster on the wheel. Run, 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 run. The more he runs, the faster he's got to run. And it's like, how do I get off this? And so he just self-destructs in, in some you know, way, like moral failure, something like that. That happens deliberately sometimes, guys. Uh, it, it can also happen just, at, just obviously sin and temptation and a feeling like I'm doing so much. You know, I, I, I deserve this. You know, that sort of thing too. Yep. A sense of entitlement, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm entitled. I, I, I entitle different than anyone else because of what I'm doing. Yep. Pride. Pride. It's the opposite, but also failure, yeah? 
also a sense of failure. It can, it can work different ways for different people, you know? There's a celebrity pride or something. Celebrity, there's pride. Yeah. Self pity. Mm, wow. So busy writing sermons for others, he never feeds on the word for himself. Wow. Yep. 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 Yeah, always his own time in the word only revolves around preparing teaching for others rather than he's in the word for his own nurture. Yep. His own life in God suffers. Yeah. That's what we as teachers, we must look. Uh, it's a whole nother subject, but you should not even be in the Word to prepare a teaching. <coughs> Just be in the Word because you love God. You want to know God. You want to learn His Word. You find God in, the, in His Word. He nurtures you by His Word. And then when you need to teach, it'll be there. It, it's not you have to go and get, find something. It, it'll be overflowing out of you, just a, out of the abundance of your life. And you, 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 you won't be up late on Saturday night thinking, oh God, give me something to teach tomorrow. You know, when I hear that and somebody's like, oh God, give me something to preach tomorrow on Sunday morning, I think, thank God I'm not in your church. <laughs> it's going to be like boring, man. It's, you, but instead, you'll be up late on Saturday night thinking, Oh God, what is your burden for the people? What is your vision for the people? There's so much I've got to share yeah. that, you know, which of these 20, 30 different directions, Lord, is the one that you have for tomorrow? You know, that's the effect. That's effective teaching ministry when it comes from life. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus staying up late on Saturday night or Friday night? Or whatever it was, what was it Thursday night? And you know, for the Sabbath, and for going into the Sabbath, and 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 thinking, uh, oh God, give me so, give me a word for tomorrow. <laughs> what else? No time with God. No time with God, and so his own spiritual life is suffering deeply. And and but 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 because he's faithful to God, he keeps on going. Yeah, but he's but he's just doing it out of exhaustion. Not out of life. It's not life to him. You Brent. Can become really controlling. You've got to make a lot of things happen. Got to make a lot of things happen. We end up just yeah. trying to control everybody. Yeah, we're not walking in a place of freedom before God and trust. We have no trust at all for the people. Yeah? Because yeah? they're just needy, passive recipients. I'm not going to entrust anything to them. It's all got to be me. Micromanage. Micromanage everything. Yeah. Oh, man. Serious, huh? What happens to the people? Passive. Passive. Nothing to do. They have nothing to do other than complain. complain. Outstanding. Other than to review your work. <laughs> yeah. And, and compare you with the, the preacher on TV or the internet. Huh? Oh, lovely. Don't we all enjoy that? No <laughs> ownership. No ownership. Yeah, the church, the church is yours. This is not mine. It's yours. I don't have any sense of ownership or investment. Nothing is expected of me other than show up at church. Yeah, sit there. Sing a few songs, chuck money in the bucket, go home. And then we find another church next time. Find another church next time that has a more exciting program. Or something better for the kids, or you know, the preacher is more of a celebrity than you were, and that sort of thing. And then you get all the pain of that because now you've been rejected again. Uh -huh. This church is just not meeting my needs. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting fed. I'm a consumer. You hear those excuses, that's a church where leaders are doing all the work. When people are saying, this church is not feeding me and it's not meeting my needs. Yeah. That's a symptom of this problem. What else? People. Unstable. Yeah, unstable. unstable. Yeah, they're not maturing. They're babies. Yeah. Up and down. Today they're up. Tomorrow they're down. They stay as babies. They create a church hopping congregation. Yep. Go from one to the next. 
Church hopping. One to the next. Yeah. So many times you have heard from big churches, the believers would say, oh, this church just wants some money, nothing else. There's no ministry into our life. There's nothing. So yeah. people yeah. are confused. Kind yeah. Of, you know? yeah. What are we here? Yeah. Yeah. Why are we here? You know, what's really, what's really amazing, uh, and this is why so many businessmen don't want to join the church. They get so frustrated. You have this very successful businessman who's doing amazing, you know, raising up all these beautifully uh, productive uh, businesses. They come to church. What's the most they can do? Be an usher. You know, be the parking lot attendant or something or other. <laughs> And he's the CEO and real, you know, integrity and, you know, successful. And this is, this is, this is all he can do. And, and it's like the guy could run a thousand churches, you know, and, but he's never trusted with anything. And so how frustrated is he? And so what's happened in the last few decades is the businessmen, then, and I know you know this, the, the businessmen, it's, it happens all over. They get together. And they kind of give up on church. Forget yeah. that. All they, ever, all they ever see us is, is the, we're the ATM, yeah. Yeah. you know, and maybe the parking lot attendant if we're really, really favored. Yeah. Certainly the ATM. <laughs> and so, and, but they want to change the world. Yeah. So they get together and they start their own thing. They start their businessman's fellowship or, you know, something that they can actually be active. And then the pastors get all upset because I'm the spiritual leader, you know, and you're Ichabod because you've, you know, <laughs> left God's anointed and, and this what a, what a sad situation. Yeah. The other paradigm is go to the church board and they control the pastor and they tell him to do everything. Mm. And they control sure. everything because of uh, yeah. what are the other effects on the people? Fire the pastor. Why? <laughs> Why? Because he's not meeting every need? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> What's the effect on the church as a whole? No, on the people. Well, that's no, no what else? Back to the people. No opportunity to function. Yeah, a bad reputation among the. No opportunity to use their giftings. The church just withers and dies. The church is irrelevant in the community. Because, because nobody is building leaders. So no, no there are no leaders. There's no succession. And so the pastor dies or leaves, everything just folds. We have to get somebody in, you know, hopefully can then do it. No, no leader development. No new leaders. Yo, yo. Sweet outside, poisonous inside. Sweet outside, poisonous inside. Wow. Poetry. Yeah. Yeah. No future. Yeah. The church fundamentally is unhealthy. By definition, the church is unhealthy. Even though the celebrity pastor with his gifting and, and his personal charisma may be able to get a bunch of people coming, the money may be flowing, and, and there's a whole new building project. We're building a 15,000 member church. It looks fantastic, but the church is fundamentally unhealthy. By definition. Because what's the definition? What is the one characteristic of a healthy church? That is the definition of a healthy church. Wow. It's not that you have big numbers. It's not that you have fantastic worship. And all that's cool. That's not the definition, though. Every member functioning. So look at this. Thank you. Thank you. What do you think? Is, uh, how, what do you feel? What do you feel as you look at these things on the board? Okay. The effect on the leader, burnout, sickness, depression, busy, celebrity, pride, self-pity, controlling, anxiety, feeling of failure, sacrifice family, broken marriage. Who wants to be a leader? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Let's sign up. Yeah. Wow. 
fall into temptation, sense of entitlement, doesn't feed on the Word, no time with God. Is this really how we understand leadership? Is this really what we want for our leaders? Oh my goodness. Is this really what the church should look like? The impact on the people, they're confused, they complain, no ownership, consumer, fire the pastor, no opportunity to function, no leaders, no leaders being built, passive, weak, don't grow up, unstable, church hopping. Is this really what we want for the people we're serving? No. No one get there. Amen. And especially after all that hard work, after all that hard work to end up here. Oh my goodness. We need to change the way we think. We need to change the way we understand leadership. Amen. It should not be an arm wrestling match with leaders to get them to embrace this model if this is their current situation. Look on page um, 49. And here are a few answers to this. I want to point out two of them right in the middle. Number 246. The people are trained to be passive. They're trained to be passive. See, we can't just complain about it. We do, but we shouldn't. Because we're the ones who have trained them to be passive. We've trained them just to be spectators and even critics. So we should not feel sorry for ourselves when they end up just, you know, when they're complaining and critical. We have set this thing up. And look at the one below. This is a shocker. Think about it. The harder that the leaders work, the less healthy the church becomes. Isn't that an amazing irony? The harder the leader works, the less healthy the church becomes. The less that the people do, the less healthy the church becomes. And so there you are. Work, 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 never stopping out of your love for God, love for the people, your sense of faithfulness, your sense of duty. <laughs> working, 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 and all you're doing is burning yourself out you're meeting needs, but you're not building the church. You're meeting needs, but you are making the church more and more unhealthy. The harder you work. Wow. This is the reality. First task of the leader. Yeah, face reality. Look, please, on page 50 in the second box. Three potential approaches to ministry in a local church. One, leader focused. Leader does everything. Everyone else watches. We're all passive recipients. Second is program focused, where the leader establishes ministry programs and that's tries to get the people to run them. Thirdly, people-focused. The leaders build life, equip the people to function, and then oversee the ministries that naturally come out of that life. Which is the biblical model? So here is the role of the leaders. Build leaders, shape culture, create the environment for the people to do the work. And what does it mean to equip the people? What does it mean to equip people to do the work? Whatever is necessary to prepare the people to do the work. And so that includes shaping culture, building leaders, uh, ministry, uh, spiritual infrastructure. Here's the role of the leader. Again, this is Paul's vision in Ephesians 4. It could not be simpler. 
it could not be more clear, yeah? The leaders equip the people, then the people do the work of the ministry, and then the body of Christ is built up. This is the vision of the healthy church. This is God's vision for His bride for whom He gave His Son. Yeah. Um, I just want to share an experience. Uh, we were doing this training and um, just asking the same questions, asking the leaders. There were about 100 leaders in the room, all frontline leaders, church planters. So we asked this question um, because everybody understood their role as busy work, you know, do the ministry work, no rest. If you rest, you are not spiritual. So just hard work yeah. all the time. So we asked this question, if you keep this mentality, if you keep this paradigm, you do everything for the people, you replace people, you, you, you one person do, do 20, 20 people's work and work yourself so hard, okay. If you keep this mindset, what happens to you? What happens to the people? What happens to the church? And every, you know, people were just shouting out ideas and were shouting out all of those and we kept, and as we shout out, we were really laughing because it sounded so absurd. It sounded yeah. so, yeah. you know, funny. And yeah. so we were laughing, we were laughing and I was laughing with people. But as I was laughing, suddenly I, I felt the grief of the Holy Spirit. Mm. I felt the grief, I felt the sadness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was asking me, really? Is this what, what, is this what I want for the leaders, for the men and the women Amen. who so faithfully, sacrificially yeah. serve me? Is this the future I have for them? No, and I, 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 even though they were working so hard, but is this the future? Is this where I want them to lead my people to? Yeah, is this, you know, Although they are working so, they are serving so sacrificially, it is where I want the church to end up. I really sense the sadness of the Holy Spirit. I began to weep. I was laughing. And I really began to weep. And then I asked people this question. Is this the future you want for yourself? Is this the future you want for the people you are serving? Is this the future you want for your church? Are you really working for this? Is this the vision? Is this where you want to end up? And I really felt like, you know, God's leader care plan is the leaders equip the saints. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the saints do the work. Amen. And the church being built up. That's God's leader care for those who serve him. Amen. That's God's love Amen. and care for us. Amen. Leave it to us. We work ourselves to death. We work our family to brokenness. That's why God is calling us to return to his strategy, to his path, because he has love and care for us. He has a bright future, a great future, a happy future for us, not to end up there. God doesn't want us to end up there. So if we don't want to end up there, we really need to embrace a change of paradigm. We really we desperately need to embrace God's strategy, His path. Leave our path, embrace His path, because He leads us into a glorious future. Abundant life, abundant life to the leaders themselves, abundant life to the people, abundant life to the church. Amen. Let's embrace this paradigm change. Amen, wow. Yeah, let's stand together, please. In our teams, let's please lift up our voices to God and let's pray that God will give us in our hearts and minds these paradigm shifts. And then that God will use us to help many leaders in our countries to experience these paradigm shifts and to move from unhealthy to healthy. Let's lift up our voices to God now. Hallelujah. Lord, we just give you glory, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, help us. Delegate. Help us, Lord. 
Father, we receive your word. We receive your truth. Come, Lord, set us free from the traditions of man and from fundamentally unhealthy ways, from uh, wrong approaches to ministry and to leadership. Set us free from the things that have been destroying our lives and have been destroying our churches and the people we serve. Lord, that we would be healthy leaders with a healthy understanding of what leaders do and a healthy understanding of what the church is and can be and must be of your design, of your calling. And Lord, let us honor the people of God, no longer treat them as babies, but instead recognize the extraordinary calling that you have given each one of them and to draw forth that calling, to call that out of them and help them to be raised up, to function with power and integrity and effectiveness. And through this work that we would be your instruments in building churches that are healthy. Father, by your spirit, we turn from the ways of the past and we embrace a path of change. And Lord, we haven't figured this all out yet. We don't know exactly what this means or, or how to do it, but we entrust ourselves into your hands that you will lead us. You will take us from glory to glory. You will lead us on a path forward and we will see deep change in the churches, in our nations, <coughs> that you will raise up a healthy bride, a beautiful bride, a healthy body and a glorious temple in all of the nations represented in this room. Father, by your spirit, we give yourself to this vision and to this work. Help us, encourage us, sustain us. Let us not back down. Let us not settle for anything less by your power. And we will follow you step by step. 